Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Heights, and also the founder of Prep Athletics. And on today's podcast, we are joined by Ben Farmer. Uh, ben is the head coach of the Williston Northampton School. Coach Farmer played a postgrad year at St. Thomas More for Coach Jerry Quinn, who's been on the podcast before, uh, before earning a scholarship to play at Marist. And Coach Farmer's also been a college assistant coach, both at the D3 level and D1 at Wesleyan and Hartford. And uh, Hartford now going from D1 down to D3. So let's get into that. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Corey. Appreciate you having me, man. Yeah, it's, we've talked all the time. Now it's good to share our conversations with the public. And um, so you you coached at Hartford, and I just saw the headline, they're going from D1 to D3. Can you explain to us why they'd be doing that? Because you might have the inside track a little bit more than everyone else. I don't I don't have the inside intel, Corey, to be honest with you. Um you know, I'm obviously following it like everybody else. And it's just really sad and unfortunate, I think, for the coaches, the players, uh, and not just basketball, all the sports, you know, those kids that are that are there right now. This is a life changing thing for all the coaches, all the players, everybody involved. So it's just really unfortunate. Um, you know, I think they're claiming it's obviously financially driven, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't understand it. I don't, I'm not obviously behind the scenes there. I don't know what drove them to make this decision specifically, but, uh, just really unfortunate because it impacts so many, uh, obviously students and also coaches. So, um, I, I, re you know, I know coach Gallagher very well and the staff and some of their players and former players, and I can't imagine what they're going through right now. And, you know, I feel for all of them and, you know, uh, knowing Coach Gal though, I I got a lot of faith that he's gonna he's gonna work really hard. He's gonna do this the right way, and uh, you know, whatever happens, he's gonna you know he'll go out on a good note, one way or the other. So yeah. I'm gonna wish them nothing but the best. Just the the quick article I saw. I think the university would save nine million a year going from nine D million to D three. Yeah, and I don't know what that is in their in their budget. How how big that is or small but it must've been significant enough. So, and I'd love to hear behind the scene, maybe for another time, hear why they actually did that. Like, cause they're gonna become less relevant now, potentially, right? Oh, hundred percent. And I think it's, I don't know what their admission model is for the rest of the student body there, but I have to think that that is part of the reason. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I went to Marist College, which is a small, you know, mid-major division one school. We weren't generating, you know, millions of dollars for our school. I mean, there's so few division one programs that are actually football and basketball that actually bring in revenue. Um, but I think it's more about, obviously, you know, I remember we've had, you know, we had a couple good years at Marist, you know, I think my junior year, we won the regular season championship and we were on national television a few times. And I think that exposure, I think our applications were like through the roof the following year. So I think that's, uh, obviously part of the motivation for schools to stay with division one is it just makes you very relevant. Um, you know, because not many people know who Marist college is right. you know, or university of Hartford or whatever it may be, you know, so now you're attracting people from California, Florida, from all over the country, from all over the world, because they want to go to a school where, you know, they're competing in division one athletics and then maybe one day have an opportunity to play in that tournament that we all love. Didn't Rick Smith's go to Marist? Yeah. Is that the no, most famous? Yeah. yeah. Is that the most famous basketball grad from that program? Yeah, yeah I think so. Okay. Um, he definitely is. Uh, yeah. It's not even close. And then there are a few others though. Uh, you know, obviously Jared Jordan, somebody I played with, uh, he was a second round draft pick by the Clippers. Uh, he's from Hartford, Connecticut, uh, new England guy. So um, he had an incredible career and the list goes on. I mean, there was a ton mm -hmm. of good players there. Coach McGarity, Dave McGarity was there a long time, did a great job. And then I played for coach Matt Brady for four years. Sure. Uh, and Matt's now in Maryland, correct? Yeah, now in Maryland. Uh, had a great run at James Madison after Marist. And now he's at Maryland doing a great job. We were actually talking the other day. So 
Yeah, nice. Well, tell me, Ben, what's your background? Where did you grow up? And of all the sports, why did you pick basketball? Oh, it's a good question. Uh, I grew up in Southern Connecticut, Clinton, Connecticut, about 25 minutes outside of New Haven. And, um, you know, grew up playing all the sports, you know, uh, football, basketball, baseball, soccer, anything, you know, my dad, he was a football player, you know, he played at Boston College. And so I actually come from a football family. My grandfather played football at the University of Michigan. Um, so it's pretty ironic that my brother and I, I had an older brother, Jeff, he played Division One basketball as well. Um, it's funny that we both ended up playing basketball instead of football. But, you know, my dad he, and my mom and dad, my mom and dad were always great. They supported us in whatever we were passionate about. And uh, he didn't care what it was, whether it was basketball or art or music or football or baseball. He was just like, whatever you guys want to do, do it, you know, do it right. Work hard. Um, you know, so it was great having that type of support from our parents. And then, uh, and then, yeah, basketball kind of like we were growing up at a time where, you know, you're going to the park after school. Like I remember seeing sitting in class in seventh grade and seeing like the heat ripple on the, on the, uh, on the roof of the building. And I knew we were playing that day, you know, cause yeah. it was good weather. We're going to be out there. And that's really where my passion for basketball started to take hold. And my, I had an older brother, Jeff, who was very passionate about basketball. So that kind of dragged me along. He'd always throw me in the car and I'd go play against older guys. You know, I very rarely played against guys my age, Corey. You know that growing up during your time. I mean, we didn't play indoors a lot either. Like, you know, I'd love to see these kids get back outside and go to the park and look for good games. And we used to drive around, you know, like, you know, drive into Haven, drive to, you know, find different courts, find games. And that's where you, you know, you learn a lot about yourself as a player, as a young man, um, because your manhood gets tested, you know, out there. And uh, that's where I really developed my passion for the game of basketball. And, and then one thing, you know, continues to lead to the other. And I had great coaches growing up. My high school, public high school coach was great. My AAU coach, Kevin Kehoe, who you know well, mm -hmm. uh, now at Winston, he was an incredible coach. And, and then obviously Coach Quinn at St. Thomas More. And so... Well, tell me this. It's so everyone says they want to play D1. And here yeah. you had two members of your football playing family go D1. What, what was the recipe for your all? And I'm guessing you're both guards too, right? Yeah, we were both like, you know, combo guard shooters. My brother was more of a shooter. I was, more, I'd probably handle it a little bit more, uh, but he could shoot the heck out of it. Um, what was your secret recipe? So, because everyone's always wanting to know how do you unlock the door to D1, especially as a guard. What was yours? Yeah, you know, Corey, I don't know, man. If I had the answer to that one, I think I'd be, you know. <laughs> Sell it. I, we were never really focused on it. I think my brother probably sophomore year of high school decided, hey, you know what? I want to do this. I want to go for it, you know. And we had a lot of support, you know, from our coaches and from our, our parents and the people around us, our friends. Um, and then having it, for me, it was having an older brother that, you know, I saw the sacrifices. I saw the the work ethic, you know, he was, you know, constantly out in the driveway, getting shots up. He was constantly dragging me out there, Benny, let's play one-on-one, -on -one. you know, like, and that's where, you know, I watched him. That. And then I decided I wanted to do the same thing. And, and uh, that's kind of, and then my dad, obviously, you know, he played division one football. So he knew, I think what it, the sacrifices and the hard work that it takes and the commitment, um, and he would never force us to, you know, go, hey, you know, go work out, go lift weight. None of that. But, you know, he'd come home from work and he'd say, you know, what'd you guys do today? What'd you do today, Benny? And it, I was like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. I hung out. I went and hung out with my friends. We went to the beach. We went to the pool. And he'll be like, all right, that's cool. You know, it, you know, just don't, you know, don't tell me you want to play Division One basketball. So that was kind of like, and he wasn't hit, you know, busting my chops about it. He was just like, you know, kind of reminding me. And then it was just interesting though, because it kind of jolted me a couple of times. And I was like, you know what? I'm right. Like, if I'm going to say I'm going to do something, like I don't know where my mouth is. So that's, uh, I think growing up in that type of environment and then having the support of all my coaches and, you know, obviously Coach Keo, my public high school coach, Coach Braun, um, they pushed me hard, you know, and they, they really, they pushed me past my comfort zone. And I think that's probably another 
difference between, you know, division one, division two, II, division three is really getting outside of that comfort zone and learning to, to play the game, like that pit in your stomach, like that's, that's division one basketball. Like that's just constant. Like you kind of have to just be comfortable with that uncomfortable feeling. And, and when you're working out and playing, like that's the, the level that you got to be at as much as you possibly can. Yeah. That was every day of my basketball career. <laughs> it felt like yeah. that, just like that, that pressure, right. And you have to have, it. if you're not in a pressure situation, are you really getting better? Probably not. No. Yeah. Like, so that's why we used to travel around and try and find good pickup games. You know, like we didn't want to play against guys that we were better in than, you know, like we grab four or five of us, we'd get in the car and we just go show up at a court and Hey, let's see what we can do here. You know? And that's, uh, that's kind of, you know, how it all came together for us. And I fell in love with it. I really did. I fell in love with this, the, the competition, the, the stage, you know, being out there and performing, at least trying to, uh, because it got me ready. You know, when you get to college and you're playing in front of thousands of people or you're on ESPN, it's like, wow, this game, I can't believe it's brought me to where it has, but it's pretty cool, man. So you're at Wilson Northampton right now. And, you know, I've been there a couple of times. I think it's a beautiful campus. Actually, we've connected on a couple, couple of players over the years that have done pretty good. Um, What's your pitch when you talk to a family? Why should they come to Wilson Northampton? I think, you know, obviously it's a, you've been here, Corey. It's a beautiful location. You know, we're about 25 minutes north of Springfield, Massachusetts. So, um, you know, taking basketball and academics out of it, it's really a great place to live and go to work and, and go to school every day. Um, I don't think we're as rural maybe as some other boarding schools. So like, you know, you can get outside of the bubble, go get a slice of pizza, you know, go get some ice cream, like kind of, you know, shake it up a little bit, which I think helps our students and just the, you know, the, re the repetition, you know, and sometimes boarding school can get the walls can start to close in on you a little bit. So I think to, to have the opportunity to get outside for a second or two, just to, you know, is really valuable. And then obviously, you know, the academics in the, in the athletic program, I think are, are as good as it gets, you know, uh, I think for the level that we play at, um, you know, it's a strong academic program. We can challenge the kids in the classroom. They can continue to grow as students. And then on the basketball court, you know, we're, we're building a, a program, you know, it, I'm in year five now, you know, and there was success before me and we're trying to continue that success as we move forward. And we're bringing in great kids who are good students and basketball, you know, I think it's interesting how recruiting works sometimes, you know, um, basketball is obviously very important to me. And I think it's important to the players in our program too. And, you know, I think when you're recruiting, you kind of, we find each other, you know, the, the people like, I don't, I'm not the type of coach, Hey, go to the gym, do like, they just go, you know, because it's important to them and I'm going to be there. And I'm like, cause that's the one thing I can't teach, you know, it's passion for the game and, I think the more people that we have in our program that are that basketball is very important to them, uh, the better. Yeah, and that was going to be one of my questions is of all the guards that reach out to you, you being a former college guard yourself, what are you looking for specifically in that position? Is one you just yeah. said, it sounds like uh, the passion for the game and wanting to do stuff on your own. But what else are you looking for? First and foremost, Corey, is that obviously the passion. And then secondly, it's guys that can shoot the basketball mm -hmm. and basketball and that can dribble the basketball those are the three things and um because it, the game now is such positionless basketball and that's how we play too so if we have guys in our system in our program that can do those three things I think we can be pretty successful because we run motion offense and you know we're shooting we're passing and then guys are handling it you know driving at you spraying it uh getting the ball up the floor um so yeah, those are the three things that I look for from a basketball standpoint. And then it's all the intangible stuff behind it, which is really hard, you know, to, to evaluate, especially now, uh, because all we're doing is watching video, you know, and the two or three minute highlights. And, you know, we're going to try and get out there as best as we possibly can to see some kids. But, um, you know, I think everybody has the ability to be a great competitor. Coach Quinn always says that he, you can teach everybody to be a great competitor. You can't teach everybody to be a great basketball player if they aren't potentially great. So if you can combine those things, you know, and 
and inspire and bring that great competitiveness out of somebody. And then they're, you know, they're skilled too, and they can shoot, pass and dribble. And that's a good, good recipe. So that's kind of, that's kind of what we follow. Or at least okay. And we've talked about thinking outside the box this year. Is there anything in the past couple of years you've, you've tried to do differently in your program that you want to share or you have some proprietary ways on doing things or, or what? No, I, I'm a, I'm an open book court. You know that, um, you know, I think it evolves and it changes every single year. And I think that's kind of what we're about, you know, like, yeah, I have an idea how we want to play every year, but it changes, you know, the group two years ago, not this past season, but the season before it, we were more athletic. So we did some pressing. I have never taught, you know, full court pressure in my, like, so it was new for me and it was awesome, you know, cause I'm constantly trying to, you know, I'm open to everything. I want to learn. I want to grow as a coach and I want our players to be in the same frame of mind as well. So, uh, you know, as far as COVID, obviously this year, uh, you know, I think we all had to get very creative within our own programs. You know, how do we provide a great experience for this group? Because games weren't guaranteed. You know, we played eight basketball games this year. Uh, we played great competition. We played all double A schools. You know, we played uh, Wilbraham and Munson, Winch, Cushing, uh, Worcester Academy. Um, so it was, you know, I recruited, probably, you know, we brought in, you know, a couple more guys than we typically would because I felt it was going to be super important to have really good numbers and games in the fall and in the winter because we didn't know what the season was going to look like. So, um, you know, trying to get creative with what that, and, you know, we had a ton of, you know, obviously New England recruiting report, Adam Finkelstein, having them come to town and uh, just trying to, you know, make this a great experience for our, our players, especially our postgraduate and, the, and our seniors, you know, we wanted them to have a great experience. So they're going out on a high note get them as much exposure as we possibly could um, and help them improve as basketball players and as students. Yeah, that's great. So, um, and I know we've talked about some things offline. We'll keep those proprietary. Yeah, yeah. Some of your plans for the future, but I think they're pretty neat. Uh, yeah. We can talk about that if, and see if it worked or not. Um, one new segment we're going to do on the podcast is the process of it, Court. Yeah, exactly. No. One new thing we're doing on the podcast, you're the first, you're the guinea pig on this, is famous alumni from prep schools that we're talking to. So uh, my resource for this Wikipedia, I'm just going to give you a few names of folks that I thought were interesting that have gone to Wilson Northampton. And okay. like, every prep school has a senator or a founder of some company. Um, yeah. But I've, I've picked out a couple of random ones here from you guys. Okay. Ram Das. No I think, idea. I think he's a spiritual healer. I think... That name, I think he's big in either Buddhism or acupuncture or something really? new, new agey, yeah. Um, or he was a musician. I, I, I should have researched that a little bit more before I threw it out there. Yeah. Uh, the actress Ann Dowd. Oh, yeah. She spoke at our graduation three years ago. Yep. Was she incredible, Steve. Yeah, she was in movies. Uh, oh, gosh. She's in The Handmaid's Tale, and she's in a lot of that's movies. You'd recognize her. Yeah, The Handmaid's Tale. That's She's incredible. In that. she, she won a Golden Globe for it, I think, actually. Yeah, yeah. She's super cool. Okay. Comedian Brian Callen. I didn't know that. Yeah. I got to get my home. And he talks about prep schools quite a bit, and that means he's mentioning – he never mentions your name, but I've heard him on podcasts. I go, yeah, I went to prep school with this and that. So, okay. And then lastly, Brad Hall. Oh, yeah. So for those that don't know about Brad Hall, he was on SNL for a minute in the 80s, and he yep. is married to Julia Louise Dreyfus. There you go. So that's our fun segment uh, for famous um, alumni. We didn't do it with Jay Tilton at Exeter. I could have said Mark Zuckerberg, oh, the, the arcade fire, every senator. Yes, on there, yeah. No, yeah, I have a funny story, actually. Brad Hall and uh, uh, Julianne Dreyfus. We, when I was at Wesleyan with Coach Riley, we recruited uh, their son mm -hmm. as a player. So, and this was obviously before I got to Wilson, so I didn't know, you know, uh, they were the best. Great, great people. They came to campus, watched practice once. He ended up going to Northwestern, I think, the kid. Uh, but it was really, really cool. Um, and that's, you know, these prep schools, boarding schools, it's incredible, you know, the, it, you know, it's incredible to see what some of these people end up doing after their time here. And they go back and, you know, when you hear them speak, they attribute a lot of their success to the time that they had in boarding school they learned and grew so much during their time there so yeah like another 
Yeah, another fun game too is, uh, and we don't have to do this now, but it's, it's, I've heard it somewhere, but it's who's the most famous person in your phone. And I did that with John Carroll at Northfield Mount Hermon. And it, I can't tell you who it was, but it was, it was big time and funny because he kept a voicemail from him. And, really? uh, because his son was looking for, for options. And, uh, gotcha. I think mine and my phone's Brad Miller, but that's family. So, hey, that's a big one. <laughs> who's in yours? Figuratively. Um, <laughs> I know this is I'm springing this on you this is bad bad podcasting here but yeah no I don't know man I don't even know off the top of my head I'd say a couple of names but they probably don't know. yeah yeah just you know LeBron wants to keep his privacy and relationship with yeah, him private yeah. so LeBron Bird, you know all the basics let's talk about this so New England is broken down into triple a double a single a uh, yep. below that and then non-affiliated schools and you guys are single a um, I got to explain to family sometimes the differences, but tell me what's the benefit in your mind of being a single A school and does that hamper you at all? Or is there any benefits to it? Um, yeah, there's definitely benefits to it, you know, but it definitely hampers us too, you know, and I bet you the AAA and AA schools would probably say something, you know, similar because, you know, obviously AAA, like that's the highest level of basketball, you know, no ifs, ands, or buts. We all know that. I think, you know, class A, B, C, they're starting to get better as well, you know, um, you know, A and B in particular, you know, class B, like, I don't know if there's much difference any now between A and B, you know, the depth, uh, it's, it's really incredible. Um, I think, you know, for us, when we're recruiting, when we're talking to families, obviously talking about the, you know, the, the rigor of the academic program that we offer here, um, and it's, it's high level basketball too, you know, every year, I think we're going to have, you know, two or three scholarship level prospects and two or three kids that are going to go on to play high level division three basketball. And we all know, you know, that high level division three basketball is, you know, those kids can play and they're getting a great education. Um, a lot of them can are probably scholarship prospects, you know, they just, you know, for whatever reason land at, you know, these other schools and I remember I was coaching at Wesleyan and every, you know, this is obviously, you know, Duncan Robinson's running up and down the floor for Williams. And I was like, the hell is he doing here? <laughs> you know, like six, right. seven, pulling from, you know, one step inside half court line. So, uh, you know, coaching at Wesleyan really opened my eyes up to that division three world. And it was an incredible experience. I got to work for coach Riley, He's a great coach, great teacher, uh, just a great guy. And, I was like, wow, you know, this, this is, this is high level stuff. You know, these kids can really play, um, you know, and obviously you pair that with the academics. It's, it's remarkable what those kids do. And I think we try and follow that, you know, that model, you know, the class A of the NEPSAC, you know, I think we, you know, we see the, uh, the NESCAC schools and what they do. And I think, um, you know, a lot of our kids will go on and play at those schools. So that's kind of, you know, again, to go back and answer your question, I think it's a combination. You know, I think the triple A's have their, you know, frustrations when they're recruiting and the double A's. And I think the single A's, you know, like we're always up against that, you know, is, hey, they're playing, you know, 30 games, 35 games a year against, you know, this type of competition. And that's why for me, you know, we try and play up as, as much as we possibly can, you know, to try and get the kids exposure, give them an opportunity to play against this type of talent. Um, so, yeah. And speaking of placing your kids, you know, you mentioned you try to get three scholarship players a year and three high academic kids a year yeah. last year with COVID. What was it like trying to place your kids? Yeah. I mean, it was difficult, you know, um, we were very fortunate, you know, we, we, you know, we had a couple, we have kid going to LIU Brooklyn, a kid going to Sacred Heart. So two kids that are going on to play division one basketball and then four kids that are going to you know, Wesley and Middlebury, Franklin and Marshall and McAllister. So very high academic division three schools that are really good at basketball too. Um, you know, and, you know, did I think COVID probably impacted, you know, obviously the recruiting landscape this year and, you know, colleges, everybody getting their year back and, you know, and then obviously the transfer portal and, you know, there was a lot of contributing factors. Um, but I think these kids, you know, they're all going to great schools, uh, and then you have a lot of help and support, you know, from AAU coaches and everybody's, you know, we're all in this thing together and we're all trying to get these kids to where they want to go. And um, so, yeah, it was, you know, it was definitely unique and it was challenging in its own way. Um, but I think it's going to be challenging. You know, I think every year now it's just going to continue to get more uh, competitive, you know, so. 
And with that being said, now that you've gone through, you know, placing the kids from class of 2020, 2021 during this COVID time, is this going to change what kind of kid you're going to bring on campus knowing the challenge is going to be to place them? Or will it be business as usual for you? It's, I don't, you know, I think every year, you know, when I'm recruiting ever since year one, that's, you know, that's a thought that pops into my mind, you know, all the time. And it's at the forefront of it is, all right, where is, what's the next step for this young guy, you know, and where do I think it is and where do they think it is and the parents and, you know, making sure that we're all on the same page and we're not, you know, promising something or, you know, I don't know, you know, my, I want to be as transparent as possible with families and let them know, Hey, this is where I think your kid might be. And um, I think this extra year or, you know, where they ultimately could be, um, but yeah, I think every year, Corey, for me, it's definitely part of my, you know, when I recruit, I think about that, you know, and it's at the top of my list. So. Yeah. And the key is you have to let them know ahead of time. It's not a guarantee spending this money or spending this year, or multiple years at a place does not mean you will get your goal. You can actually try for it, but my gosh, everyone wants a scholarship and that's become harder and harder. And speaking of that, Ben, what, what are your thoughts on the transfer market that the NCAs or the portal that the NCAs got this year? You've been at that level. You were a D1 assistant. You played D1. Like, yeah. give me your thoughts. Yeah, I'm torn on it a little bit. You know, I think the NCAA, obviously, this was a tough year to allow kids to go play right away and not sit. Um, could they have pushed it off one more year? And what would that look like? Who knows? Um I think if a kid wants to leave, you know, he should be able to leave, especially if there's a coaching change, you know, and I think that was already a rule. Uh, kids would be allowed to go play if their coach that had recruited them either, you know, was let go or left. Uh, but I, I'm torn on it, man. You know, part of me is like, all right, you didn't play a lot as a freshman, right? Uh, hang in there. You know, if you like the guys on the team, you like the coaching staff, you fit in well at the school, hang in there for another year. See, you know, work, you know, Get in the gym, figure it out, get with the coach, you know, watch a lot of film. You know, I think that was, that's huge. You know, I don't think kids watch enough, enough film these days, you know, mm -hmm. um, don't just, you know, we live in this world now. It's everything's quick, you know, everything's fast. It's bang, bang, you know, hang in there, give it another year, you know, have a great off season, you know, and try and get better and then see what happens, you know? And then after your sophomore year, still not happening and you know you're not whatever it's not feeling right then maybe you know explore the transfer market i just know that you know transferring is hard you know it's you're going to a whole new school a whole new situation it's a tough transition for a kid you know um and i think it sounds great you know when you're in it and you're going through the process but i think when they get there it's a lot harder than they thought it was going to be so it's like that's when we when we're sitting with the kids and they're going through their recruiting and their decision making. It's, you know, hey, do you like the guys on the team? Do you like the staff? And do you think it's a good level for you? Do you see yourself playing there early on in your career? Um, you know, and, and go through those when you are making your decision about where you want to go to college, because everybody wants to play, Corey. You know that. Mm -hmm. like, no one wants to sit on the bench for four years. I get that. So having that guidance and, you know, that sort of thought process as you're making this decision, you know, when I went to Marist, you know, I think they were coming off a year where they were six and 25 or something. And I was being recruited by schools that were more successful wins and losses, but I love the guys on the team. I love the coaching staff and I love the school. And I felt it was a good level for me. I thought, I thought, and there's no guarantees, like you said, but I thought I could have an opportunity to play early on in my career. And that's why I made the decision that I made. And I just want that for all these kids, you know, and that's uh, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting, Corey. Um, it's early, you know, this is the first year of it. So let's see what happens. Let's see how it goes. You know, Danny Hurley at UConn, he mentioned something he, he, you know, he's going to build his thing on player development, skill development. He's not going into the portal and, you know, so it's, Everybody has their own way of doing it. You know, I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way. Let's see what happens. It's going to be super interesting, though. Yeah, we'll get to give my two cents in the transfer. I've got a podcast coming up where I actually mentioned that I transferred in high school, halfway through my sophomore year. And without that transfer, I don't think I would have played D1, right? Yeah. So, you know, while it looks frustrating on the surface to see all these kids transfer, 
it's an individual decision, right? Oh. Each kid needs to come up with. In fact, five of my former clients, by former, I mean prep athletics kids, I placed in prep schools, five oh. big guys, all five have entered the portal. Okay. One went from D2 to D1, upgrade. One yeah. went from a uh, big South conference to Patriot league upgrade. Yeah. One kid went from the OVC to the big East upgrade. And then yeah. a player we worked with went from the summit to the big 10 yeah. upgrade. And then my fifth kid, um, he played two years, D one, two years, D two. And he's in the Porter now as a six eleven big body kid. He's having problems. Yeah. Okay. So it just, it's, you know, we got four out of five of upgraded the situation, which on paper looks good. We'll see how yeah. it all turns out. But the fifth is a bona fide D1 big who's having trouble right now. Like all he's getting is walk-on spots. So the yeah. thing about this transfer thing, Ben, is that we're seeing this 2,000 or plus kids in that portal. They're yeah. not all going to be placed. So where are they all going to end up? Yeah. And that's why, Corey, it's like, I, you know, I want kids to, you know, just because they're already in a situation where they're on scholarship, they're getting a great education, like, the grass isn't always greener. It is in, in some of the instances, or at least I hope it is, um, you know, but yeah, there's going to be what five, 600 kids that aren't going to have home. So where do they go? You know, I think obviously junior college or, you know, they have to be open to dropping down a level or two, you know, in some situations, like, right. so, you know, that's, that's how it goes. You but know? Hey, this is capitalism, right? This is yeah. free market economy. You take the chance. And the kid, I advised the one kid that bumped up from D2 to D1. He was scared. He's like, well, I get D1. I said, I have no idea. I was like, you are going to be one of many. Right. And, but he was a kid where once the day put it in the market, he had 20 calls. How about that? Yeah. Right. So it, but the other kid, you know, uh, the 611 kid had very few calls. Yeah. And it might be timing too. So the point is everyone's got to make their own decision talk to a lot of trusted people, but just if it, it, you're right, it's not always green on the other side, and right. which, but it could be, I mean, it's a risk and life's full of risks. So what if that changes your life and, and it will for some kids, right? A hundred percent. It will. Yeah, no, I, and I wish everybody all the best, you know, the kids that do decide to transfer, like I hope they go to their school and they're happy and they get a chance to play and they're getting, you know, a scholarship and well, I want the best for everybody. Let's talk about that specifically because the player you and I are talking about, uh, we'll just say his name, it's Philip Rebraca. So I helped yeah. place Philip there uh, into a post-grad year with you. He spent three years at North Dakota where he started all three. I think he made second team all conference last year and he yeah. put his name in the portal and he talked to you. So I don't know, you, you can give his way as much information as not, but what advice were you helping him with since he did have a lot of demand? Yeah, he did. Um, you know, obviously, you know, you and I both know what it's, he was when he came here um and I, I i thought he would have a very successful college career uh you know his situation was unique you know philip's a very loyal person you know i think this was a very this is a hard experience for him um but there's reasons that he had to make the decision he had to make and it was really about you know because being an international student and maintaining his i-20 status and student visa he needed to be in an in-person graduate program and he's a very smart kid he graduated completed his undergrad in three years so he needed to be in an in-person graduate program unfortunately uh the school that he was at didn't offer that and, you know and i think he put his name in and he had a lot of interest you know uh my phone was ringing a lot um you know and he's going to iowa to play for coach mccafferty and 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 yes, you know, I think what I told him was, you know, obviously the same things I told him when he was sitting in this office, you know, three or four years ago when he was making his college decision. Uh, you know, the guys on the team, the coaching staff, style of play. Um, and now he's older, you know, he's, yeah. he's what he, he knows a lot about himself. You know, he knows what his strengths are as a basketball player. He knows what his capabilities are. He knows the style that he can perform well in. Um, and I think he made a great decision. I really do. I think Coach McCafferty and everything they do up there at Iowa is, I think the league is, you know, it's probably the best conference in the country this year, right? Top to bottom. Uh, it was incredible, you know? So I think he's going to have a great, he's got two years. So um, it's going to be an adjustment for sure. Obviously the physicality, the athleticism, the size. Uh, I think offensively, he'll be fine. I think the adjustment is going to be guarding some of these guys. Uh, in the low post and he's not afraid to bang though. No. And he's, 
he's as good of a competitor as you'll get. You know, I remember games here when his game went to another level. You know, the the, the better teams that we played, he he would go to another level. So I I anticipate the same thing in the Big Ten this year for him. So I'm excited. You know, now I get to watch him you know, on national television a lot. So. But did he talk to you before he made the decision? Yeah, he did. So he had to, he was jumping off the cliff too. And yeah. I mean, you probably knew he'd have some offers, but you weren't quite sure though either, right? Or were you more so with him? A lot of interest. I didn't know, you know, power five, mm. you know, compared to other schools. You know, I didn't know the level, um, but he had a lot of power five interests, you know, and it wasn't surprising. You know, he's an established college basketball player. He's yeah. had a lot of success in a really good league. You know, the summit is big time. You know, obviously we saw Oral Roberts and what they did this year in the tournament. You know, that's who he's playing against, you know, night in and night out, you know. So he he proved himself these last three years. And I think coaches, you know, at these, you know, at every level is looking for guys that are established, you know, that have college basketball, real college basketball experience under their belt. And that's why it's just making it so hard right now for a high school kid or a prep school kid because if you're a coach, you know, and the kid played 15, 18 minutes a game in the Mac and, you know, he averaged eight points a game, like, and he's, you know, a good kid and a good student. Are you going to take that kid or are you going to take, you know, a 17 or an 18 year old kid who hasn't proven himself yet? It's just, it's a tough situation for these high school kids, especially in this 21 class. So, um, you know, I think, Phil, I think Phillip's going to do great things better to watch. Yeah, it's going to be fun to watch. But, that's the thing I'm telling people, and I'm sure you are too, is, hey, class of 21 kids, if you're a prep school kid, right, if you got the bona fides where you can go to one of these places, do it. Because you want to see how this year shakes out because you don't know, I don't know, college coaches don't know yeah. how, this, how this transfer is going to work out. Because some teams are going to have five transfers. 100%. And then, Coach you know, everybody's getting their year back too, course. So it's like, you know, the log jam now. So if, you know, kids that were freshmen, they're freshmen again. You know, and then you're coming in as a freshman, no playing time in the beginning, you know, potentially going to be hard to come by. Um, so, yeah, it's I think if you do have a an option on the table, uh, whether it's a postgraduate option or, you know, repeat 10th grade or repeat 11th grade, everybody now almost I feel like is is reclassifying at some point during their high school career if they have aspirations to play high level college basketball. Um, so if you do have an option, you know, and you don't have any good, you know, maybe the college options that you want right now, and you do have a prep option on the table. Yeah, I would, I would take it, you know, because there really, there's no downside to it. You know, it's a win-win and obviously there's no guarantees either, you know, and, uh, but kids just what they, they have to do, what's best for them and their family. Yeah. There's no guarantee, but you're going to get all the benefits that come along with prep school to go yeah. along with basketball, right? And you're going to have an advocate like yourself and all the other prep school coaches that are just more connected than most most of yeah. the country. It's one so. more year. It's one more year, Corey, to get out there and you know show what you can do. You know, and now the NCAA just came out. They're you know they're the live period is going to happen in June and what's July. Now you get another year of AAU basketball. You know, you got these federation showcases. Um, so it's going to be you know, just another, another summer, you know, to, to go out there and get the kind of exposure that these kids need, especially this class of 21, you know, now you become a class of 22 because nobody could, you know, there wasn't a live period in last year. So, you know, to have that chance again, I think is, is going to be huge for these kids. Yeah, absolutely. In your coaching career at Williston, who's been the one player that showed up and just surprised you the most? Cause I, and to, I'm going to explain that is you were a recruited kid. And I will sometimes put you in front of a kid who we never see in person and yeah. I'll sometimes never see in person, but you won't see until the day they show up on campus. Yeah. And it's a gamble because some kid might show up and be yeah. better. Some kid might end up being a dud uh, right. on a court, not as a kid, but like, who's been your biggest surprise? Oh, it's a good question. There's, there's been a ton of them, to be honest with you, you know, like, cause all you, like you said, you know, you sent me a, you know, a three minute highlight uh, clip yeah. on with Rocker, and I had to make that decision based on that and and then obviously his academics and his character and all that that you know we did that afterwards through you know calls and zooms and things of that nature but uh you know Philip obviously was a you know I, I thought he was going to be a good player uh I didn't know how good he was until he got here 
Um, and the list goes on, Tyler Thomas, Josh McGettigan, Duncan. I mean, I can go through it um, every year. I'm surprised, you know, Billy Whalen, you know, a kid who came here last year who no one knew who he was, you know, and came here, does a post-grad year for us. And now he's at Connecticut College and he played, you know, 35 minutes a game this year as a freshman. And uh, so every year it's a surprise. And it's one of the most exciting things about this is you recruit a kid, you watch their film, you think they're, you know, and you don't always get it right, Corey, you know, and that's okay, you know, but you made a commitment to a kid and their family and you see it through, you know, and, and we've been fortunate, you know, we've, I think we've, we've had a lot of good players over the years and, um, you know, it's, but it is, you never know, you know, the kid says he's 6'6", six, six, he shows up, he's 6'3". That's why we lean on people like you, Corey, you know, to, uh, to tell us what the deal is. But no, I've been very, very fortunate over the years just to have incredible kids. They're always, they surprise me every year. Uh, they're always either, you know, typically they're always a little bit better than I thought they might be, or they get better. Uh, but they're always, you know, obviously great kids and great students. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. Hopefully that's great. That's great. You have a lot of them. What's that? I said, hopefully I get a couple of surprises this year. <laughs> Well, you'll be surprised one way or the other, right? Whether they're good or not good, or or if they're as advertised, hey, you're happy yeah. with that too. So, absolutely. What's been the biggest win of your Williston career? Whew. Biggest win. Or a or at Hartford. Let's we can add NCA too. Uh, I think during my time here. Oh man, we had a great game with uh, Wolverham and Munson at UMass Amherst, double overtime game. That was a great game, um, one that I'll remember for a long time. That I had never been a part of a game like that. It was a, a last-second shot that we won on. Uh, you know, both teams played their heart out. It was a high-level game. Guys were making plays. You know, it was – it was that was probably the, the best, you know, I guess, you know, you could say game I've ever been a part of. But um, I'm trying to think, what else? Wilbraham and then – Hmm. You know, I think, uh, you know, the semifinal game against Hotchkiss uh, a few years back um, at our place was a very memorable game for us. You know, it was packed house. And again, our guys just showed up, you know, and they made plays. And it's just I think for a coach to see your guys go out there and and make winning plays and in, when, when everything's on the line, you know, in front of a, a packed house and they're drilling shots and they're making the right like. That's what it's all about for me, man. Those are the games that stand out to me that, you know, when things are on the line and, you know, it's uh, it's a, potentially could be a stressful environment and kids just really, you know, make great plays. And it's, uh, so that that's probably the most memorable. Okay. How about in your playing career, who's the best player you played against? Oof. Patrick Beverly, I think. Yeah, Arkansas. He was a freshman or a sophomore, I think. And we were, I was at Marist and we were playing him down uh, Old Spice Classic down in Florida. It was in Orlando. I was a junior. Um, and we didn't really, you know, we were playing Arkansas and we had just beat Minnesota the day before. So we were, you know, we we're like, all right, we might have a shot. It, it was the Thanksgiving, you know, preseason mm -hmm. tournaments. It's an awesome tournament. Uh, and we played Arkansas and they were, they were really good. Sonny Weems was on that team. He was like a six, eight, small four. I had to guard him. I was like, holy, you know. It was a different level. Um, but Beverly was unbelievable. He uh, he was really a phenomenal player. Just his approach, his toughness. Uh, I, I'm not surprised, you know, that he's doing what he's doing uh, nowadays. But, um, yeah, he's probably the best player I played against in college. Okay. How about um, when you're not coaching, what are your hobbies? Oh, man. Golf. I love to play golf. I uh, love to cook. That's oh, no kidding. A fun little fact. Yeah. My cooking game got pretty good this during uh, <laughs> this life that we're all living this past year. Um, that's it. You know, I'd say those two things. I like to read a lot, you know. Um, read a couple of good books these past year or so. So those three things, I think, are the things I enjoy uh, the most, you know, when, when I'm not coaching or not, you know, there's not a lot of free time, though, in this job. Boarding school life where, you know, dorm duty, you're, you're on the court, you're teaching, you're coaching, your admissions, obviously, is a big part of my job, the biggest part of my job. So, um, but yeah, I try to get up 
course, as much as I can. Okay, yeah, that's great. Getting the fresh air out there in the greens. Oh, yeah. Tell me this, uh, this is kind of an offshoot, but you working in admissions, being the head coach, I see a lot of prep schools where the head coach and admissions are not on the same page, but what benefits do you have actually being in the admission office and building your team? Yeah, I think it's huge, you know, understanding the cycle, you know, and how it works and seeing it on a daily basis is, you know, the timeline, um, you know, I think it gives the head coaches that do work in the admission office, you know, uh, little bit of a leg up you know as far as recruiting goes because you just you know how to get it done you know the, the application financial aid you know get this submitted so the, the you know you can expedite things a little quicker you know how to you know the process you know and whereas some of our coaches that are teachers or they're working in college counseling or whatever it may be it, it takes some time to learn it you know and I think we do a good job here at Williston I think we 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 educate our coaches that aren't working in the admission office about what the cycle looks like and the timeline. And, you know, here are these links, send these around, you know, just to, to get it going. And our coaches do a great job of, of, of learning, you know, cause they want to be good and they want to, you know, they're invested, you know, so, and we want to reward that investment, you know, by giving them and showing them, Hey, do this, try this, you know, and, and they take it and run with it. Yeah, that's great. That is a great position to be. And I love talking to coaches and working with them that are in mission office. Cause it's just like, I see you guys, you guys know how the sausage is made, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Last question here. It's a, it's a doozy. Uh, what's your favorite movie of all time? <laughs> this should be easy. I love movies, Corey. Uh, have you heard anyone say I hate movies though? Truthfully, <laughs> no one's ever said, you know what? I hate in life <laughs> movies. Good right. movies just are terrible to me. Yeah, some people like that. Yeah, they don't. They don't like sitting there. They think it's a waste. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's great to sit there for two hours and unplug. And uh, you can learn a lot from movies. Oh, for um, sure. Number one of all time for me, Corey, is Goodwill Hunting. Uh, and then I'll give you my favorite basketball movie of all time. <sighs> There's not like that I many. Between He Got Game, Hoosiers. And blue chips. Those are good ones, aren't they? Yeah, I mean Hoosiers is in my is my top sports movie. But my dad, my whole his whole side of the family grew up in Indiana. So like well, yeah, there you go, man. You're a yeah. Midwest guy. And then uh what about white men can't jump? Oh, it's right up there too. <laughs> Love the rim. What's that? Love the rim. Oh great, great that? soundtrack, right? That's the soundtrack. Warren G. Regulators. <laughs> I was more than the Tupac Pain was my favorite song, which was actually on the international release, which you couldn't get in Kentucky at the time. But I remember buying that junior year. I think it was in the spring. Oh, man. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, those are good. I mean, they're all great movies, man. But I'd say Good Will Hunting is probably my number one, like, overall favorite movie of all time. Yeah. How about them apples? Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, Ben, hey, brother, it was good having you on the podcast today. And, um, I appreciate you sharing all that knowledge about you, your, your background, your philosophies, your, your school of Williston, Northampton. Um, so thanks so much for coming on, my man. Absolutely, Corey. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. This was the Prep Athletics Podcast with Coach Ben Farmer of Williston, Northampton. If you guys like getting all of these, go ahead and follow me on Twitter or Instagram, and you know that'll keep you up to date on when these come out. Or subscribe on YouTube or any of the major podcasts podcasting platforms you can hear uh, us talk about prep school basketball and other other basketball recruiting related topics so thanks so much for tuning in have a great day